So the next organisational form we're going to deal with is the most popular one, one you deal with every day, the company. Company is a separate legal form and that a company is a kind of corporation. They're not, um, companies are a subset of corporations. So all companies are corporations, but not all corporations are companies. You can have statutory authorities. Um, QUT is a kind of corporation that isn't actually a company. So when we when we be clear about this, when we're dealing with companies, we're dealing with business entities under the Corporations Act um, in, in the way that they're structured. So to get a better understanding um, of the nature um, of a company, I think it's really worth having a look at one of the most important cases for businesses around the world, but particularly um, in uh, the Australian jurisdiction. And it's a, court, it's a case that actually comes from England in the late 1800s. And it's so important because corporations have only been around in terms of a general business form for people since, you know, the 1850s to 1860s. There should be an S there. Um, so really this is the first case that has to deal in detail with the nature of a company um, and that puts forward a definitive judgment at a high enough level. So to understand the case, we have to understand a little bit of the law at the time. And the, and the, and the law at that time actually said if you wanted to have a company, you just couldn't have one shareholder. Um, you actually had to have a number of shareholders. I think it was seven shareholders um, at the time. So here we have our uh, six shareholders and it just so happened that these six shareholders uh, were a member of the Salomon, Salomon family. Okay, so they're the Salomon family. And then you actually had um, Mr. Salomon, who was also, of course, a, uh, a shareholder and why don't we put him in a nice hat. And he's quite happy because he actually owns a factory. Okay, so before he would have run this as a sole, a sole trader or a partnership, but he has gotten together with his family members and he forms a company. And he actually starts the business and it's a, uh, he's a cobbler. So it's actually uh, making shoes and boots, his business. But unfortunately, in the late in the mid to late eighteen hundreds, there was the uh, Great Cobblers' Strike. It's actually a, a true incident. There was a strike of all of the shoe and boot makers, and as a result of the strike, um, the business runs into problems and goes bankrupt. Okay. So the business goes bankrupt. Now, part of the arrangements that had actually occurred uh, prior to bankruptcy was Mr. Salomon, in his own right as a person, had lent his business with a mortgage uh, the sum of 2,000 pounds. It would have been pounds back in those days, but let's call it dollars so we don't get confused. So he lent $2,000 um, to the business, to the company. Okay, so this is the, this, factory and all the people in it are the company. And he has actually lent it as a person this $2,000. There was another mortgage over here which was for $10,000 from just say a bank. So the bank's lent $10,000. Um, Mr. Salomon has lent $2,000 and he had what's called a first mortgage. So what does that mean? Well, if you held the first mortgage, it means when you go bankrupt, there's something called an order of priority as to who gets paid. There's an order as to who gets paid. And the first people who get paid are the people who have, uh, they call it secured debt or a mortgage. And in fact, the first mortgage so now I hope you can start to see some of the problem that's coming up. The first mortgage is held by this $2,000 here. And the matter before the court is, well, is that $2,000 owed to Mr. Salomon? 
Or is it really, it's just Mr. Solomon lending it to himself, because this is just him and the family, right, running this company. Shouldn't it actually go to the bank and all the other unsecured creditors? And what did the court held? The court held that Mr. Salomon is, is not the company. The company is a separate legal entity, and as such, he is entitled to his $2,000. So Salomon can get his $2,000. And you can imagine that that's a revolutionary concept at this time, and it hasn't been held out, uh, and it hadn't been held before that someone could actually do this, that they could lend their own company money, and then if the company went bankrupt, they could actually get that money back first above all the other credit creditors who'd owed money. And it set up this idea of a separate legal entity. So we have these requirements if we're going to have a company. Um, it must be registered with ASIC. Um, it must have shareholders and someone in charge, a director. It can, it can be just one shareholder and one director, although certain kinds of companies have different requirements. But at the minimum level, you need at least one shareholder and you need at least one director. Um, Often uh, it is possible for the same shareholder to be the director, but that's highly unusual, and particularly in large companies, you're not going to find that these days. So I think we've already been through um, the separate legal personality, mainly as part of week two, but also as part of Salomon and Salomon. A company can endure debts, it can hold property, it can take legal action as plaintiff or defendant. Um, and notice that even if you sell it, the business maintains it's legal entity and nothing really changes from an outside perspective. And that legal entity can enter legal relationships with the owners. The big plus that uh, comes with companies is the limitation of liability. The, lo the owners or the shareholders aren't liable for the debts of the company beyond the share capital that they're committed to. So that's an important distinction from the other legal forms that we've dealt with so far, sole traders and partnerships. Now, with companies, we have all different forms um, of company, all different types of companies, and they have different requirements on them. So a PTYLTD, a proprietary limited company, is a smaller kind of company. It has 50 members or less, and it's limited in how it can raise equity capital. So if you need to, say, issue a prospectus, you can't do that with a PTYLTD. But even within proprietary limited companies, there are small proprietary limited companies and large proprietary limited companies, and they are based on tests of turnover and or assets and or employee size. So what we find is that you can have a small proprietary limited company or a large proprietary limited company. Depending upon whether you're small or large, you have to report different things to ASIC. The idea here is, look, if it's a separate entity, um, and it comes with all the benefits that we've seen of Salomon and Salomon of limiting liability, of these kind of arrangements where you can get your money back. Then the more people who the company is going to affect, the more the government wants you to report back to society. So one of those tests is size. And when you become a large proprietary limited company, you have to report more through to government. The other kind of major kind of company is called a public company. Now, public companies can either be listed or unlisted. Listed means they are on a securities or stock exchange somewhere. Unlisted means that they're open to the public, so you can have more than 50 shareholders. You can also issue prospectuses uh, under certain conditions to raise equity capital. So it's easier to raise uh, equity capital if you're a listed, if you're a uh, public company. Uh, of course, it's much easier when you, when you go to list and people can then trade your shares fluently on an exchange so they become more valuable. But having said that, the public companies have different requirements. They need three directors, for instance. They have special requirements about conflicts of interest for directors. Uh, and they have a whole host of reporting requirements and audit requirements because they are open to the public um, and they can raise equity capital a lot more easily. So as we have seen, a public company has shares available to the public, may or may not be on the, on the stock or securities exchange. It usually you'll see the term LTD in the company name. They have more onerous reporting requirements like financial reporting and shareholder meetings and conflict of interest provisions for directors. 
and they need to have three directors, not just one director. Proprietary limited company, shares aren't publicly available. Usually you see a PTY LTD. They tend to have between one and 50 shareholders and at least, oh, they must have between one and 50 shareholders and at least one director. Like all of the entities we've dealt with, companies have advantages. Separate legal entity limited liability are the two crackers that are in place for a company. You can get this perpetual succession or unlimited life, which allows you to build value in the company and then pass it on. You can't do that if you're a sole trader because it's all in your name. You have greater sources of capital, you have expert managers to run the business, and you can more easily transfer shares, especially in public companies. However, there are downsides. Establishment and ongoing fees can be very expensive. The limited rights as an owner that you give up through the constitution, you give them up to the directors who now have all the power to act. There are often very strict administrative and reporting requirements, and if you are going to be in control of the corporation as a company director, uh, you have certain legal responsibilities um, that are imposed on you. So like all business entities, companies have these advantages and disadvantages.